One of the common criticisms that I've heard regarding The Lord of the Rings and The Return of the King in particular has to do with the second to last chapter of the book and according to Tolkien himself, one of the most important and absolutely essential chapters for the entire philosophy of Middle-earth and the plot of The Lord of the Rings. This chapter, of course, is the scouring of the Shire. In this video, we'll explore precisely why this chapter is so important, its role within The Lord of the Rings and the development of our protagonists, as well as examine the three main philosophical reasons behind its addition to the book. Let us begin with a little background. For starters, as you know, the scouring of the Shire was removed almost entirely from the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy, with a small exception being a scene alluding to it in the Fellowship of the Ring with the Mirror of Galadriel. In it, Frodo sees his fellow hobbits enslaved, the Shire changed and industrialized, the orcs polluting the land. It is portrayed as merely a warning, a possible future if Frodo fails his mission, and it is the weight of the responsibility of saving the world from this and other futures that he wishes to give the ring to Galadriel, something she thankfully declines, as I've covered before. In the book, things are quite different. Saruman is not killed by Grima Wormtongue at the top of Orthanc in the beginning of The Return of the King, the extended edition, but rather towards the very end of the book and hundreds of miles away in the Shire. Considering the length of the movie and its many endings, the removal of this chapter is understandable, albeit disappointing but I digress. In the closing chapters of The Return of the King, our heroes, the Hobbits, begin their journey home following the coronation of Aragorn as King of the Reunited Kingdoms. Frodo and Sam are honored greatly for their role in the destruction of the Ring and for saving the world, while Merry and Pippin too have fulfilled their dream of finally making a difference, of helping defeat evil and become great knights, despite their physical and sometimes even social disadvantages. It is under these circumstances and this character development that our heroes make their way home after an entire year. After such an epic, after such a struggle and such a fight against the darkness in which the quite literal personification of evil is defeated, you would expect that this would be it. What more could be added? What other things are left to be said and philosophical themes explored? After what Tolkien originally intended to be one 1500 page book, after the final defeat, we must expect our happy ending, and quite frankly, for the book to end. Well, Tolkien thought differently, and I am so incredibly glad that he did. Back to the story. Our heroes, on their way home, and the closer they get to their beloved Shire, find things to be increasingly peculiar and quite different to how they left them. They find the crossing into the Shire blocked, and a large and ugly spiked gate in their way. The gatekeeper there informs them that he was under orders from the so-called chief headquartered in Bag End not to let anyone through the crossing. After eventually managing to pass, they encounter the sheriffs, who inform them that they are being placed under arrest, with our hobbit heroes finding this whole situation merely funny at this point, though this would soon change. They manage to learn of men in the Shire who were in the service of an unknown figure known as Sharky, another new power in the region besides the chief. It is with the forces sent by Sharky that the chief, Lotho, who is a distant relative of Frodo as a Sackville Baggins, manages to take over the Shire. Lotho was very greedy, and in his newfound absolute power, he exercised full control over the hobbits of the Shire, forcing them to live in fear under his rule and changing the face of the land. He destroyed many beloved hobbit homes and buildings, and in their place he built large, ugly, industrial constructions, changing the traditional way of life of the hobbits, all in his greed. The hobbits are utterly distraught at this turn of events. Under this state of affairs, our heroes use their newfound skills, now being very different to the hobbits that left for Rivendell a year prior, to rally the hobbits of the Shire against this new tyranny that has come over their land, take back their homes and restore the natural beauty and way of life of the Shire. Thus commences the legendary Battle of Bywater, in which hundreds of hobbits fight a force of men and decisively defeat them. Following this, they have one final confrontation with Saruman, who turned out to be the mysterious Sharky, as well as with Wormtongue, who were previously loose ends within the story following Azengard's fall to the forces of good. From this confrontation, the important thing to remember is that the hobbits, and especially Frodo, offer yet another chance to the two villains, yet another chance for them to redeem themselves. Saruman at first even attempts to kill Frodo by stabbing him, but Frodo offers him forgiveness yet again. Saruman in his arrogance is angered by Frodo's pure nature and uses it as an opportunity to belittle Wormtongue, saying he is the one who killed Lotho. Wormtongue protests, saying he was ordered to by Saruman himself and the wizard kicks him into the ground. At this, Wormtongue 
having had enough of Saruman's abuse, uses his knife to slit his throat and kill him, his physical form at least. As Wormtang attempted to flee, he was finally cut down by the hobbits, and thus the story of Isengard comes to an end alongside the chapter of the scouring of the Shire. Having explained in brief what happened in the scouring, let us now explain why. Let's start with the characters themselves and the hobbits as a whole. Even though Saruman and his thugs had, both directly and indirectly, turned the Shire into a place of evil and the complete opposite to what it had stood for, freedom as opposed to what was now oppression, and even though Saruman tried to kill him, Frodo still tried to spare his life. It was yet another exercise, yet another test that this new Frodo passed and that the old Frodo that had wished death on Gollum in the beginning of the story never would have. And moving from one character to many, through the scouring of the Shire, we see the development of the Hobbits as a society and a civilization. The Hobbits had almost always been nearly unable to defend themselves and ignorant to both the world and its evils, with rangers such as Aragorn defending it from unknown evils for countless centuries. Now though, it was not some foreign warriors that saved them. With the guidance of our heroes, the Hobbits rise up, they unite against their oppressors and they drive them out of their homes. This is why Gandalf has been so notoriously absent from these events. The wizard made the conscious decision to let the hobbits grow, just like our four hobbits grew. They were ignorant to the world, and now they were not. They were feeble and weak, but once united, and once they understood the situation they were in, and given the opportunity, they faced their fears and achieved victory. The hobbits were no longer the same, they were better. This is a major reason why the scouring is so important, why it had to happen. Our characters, alone growing and experiencing development was not enough. The hobbits had to fight against the destruction of their home, or what was the point? What would be the point of a people that merely existed without paying heed to the things that affected them? Beyond the hobbits themselves of course, through the scouring we see Tolkien's environmentalism and opposition to industrialization, something he saw negatively as covered in my previous video. While Tolkien himself has outright denied any notion that the chapter is directly allegorical to the situation the English countryside and England as a whole was experiencing, with the drastic changing of the landscape and the people as well as pollution, we still see many parallels. If not conscious, then at least subconscious, through his representation of what good and evil is. For Tolkien, good was nature, it was simplicity, it was freedom and it was family, and evil was partly industrialization's destruction of nature and its effect on society. As such, the good would have the former characteristics, while the bad would have the latter. In simple terms, in order to move on, Tolkien viewed the effects of industry as evil through his own personal experiences in industrialized England, and he thought its opposite as what was good. His portrayal of good and evil was according to his beliefs, which were influenced by his experiences without his writing necessarily being a commentary of those experiences. With that said, the Shire is natural. It is simple living, it is portrayed as the proper way of life. Tolkien himself, after all, has often described himself as a hobbit, at least in spirit, so this should not come as a surprise. Our heroes return to their home, the personification of nature and the proper way to live, and they find nature destroyed and their way of life changed. They do not give up, however. Despite the insurmountable obstacles and difficulties, and even though the task may seem impossible, they overthrow the oppressive power that has polluted their land and changed their way of life. And in the next chapter, Samwise uses Galadriel's gift to help restore the Shire and bring life back to nature. Overall, it is a message of hope that regardless of how much you are oppressed, regardless of how much the odds are stacked against you, as was the case with the quest of the ring after all, if you really try and you put your mind to it, and your cause is just, you will succeed, you will win, nature will be restored. Even though this chapter is so incredibly dark, filled with evil and depressing themes, it is not these things that characterize it. What characterizes it are hope, perseverance and forgiveness. The world may seem dark, yes, but it is up to us to make it a better place. It is up to us to overcome our difficulties and it is up to us, while we do all of these things, not to lose ourselves, not to become vengeful or prideful or greedy, not to lose sight of what is important. For some, it may seem like this chapter was unnecessary and it was rightfully removed from the movies, but for me, this chapter is exactly what makes Tolkien unique. This is why The Lord of the Rings is, for me at least, not just a work of fantasy or fiction, it is a work of hope and of small people doing big things but staying true to themselves. Thank you very much for watching.